Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, April 27th, 2015. Today was the day of the funeral of Freddie Gray, the man who died when his spine was severed in police custody. Immediately after the funeral, hundreds of protesters confronted police, and we now learn that seven officers have been hurt in the clashes. The uh, police captain there said some have suffered broken bones. One of them, he says, is unresponsive. Now, this comes after the Baltimore mayor said this weekend that space was provided to those who wished to destroy. Listen to her comments, what she said. She said, I've made it very clear that I work with the police and instructed them to do everything that they could to make sure the protesters were able to exercise their right to free speech. It's a very delicate balancing act because while we tried to make sure they were protected from the cars and other things that were going on, we also gave to those who wished to destroy to those who wished to destroy space to do that as well. Now that may sound strange to a lot of people, but we have pointed out over and over again that the intent of the government, of the federal government, of many of these Democrat-run cities is to have a divide and conquer strategy. They want you to divide into black people against the police and have people see the black people rioting and destroying so that they take the side and polarize behind the police when we have real police brutality issues that need to be addressed. Now, later on the show, we're going to talk to an Oath Keeper, Brandon Rapola. He is at the mine right now in Oregon, the uh, Sugar Pine Mine, where the BLM threatened to shut them down and violently throw them out this last Saturday. That didn't happen because Oath Keepers showed up there. They're not just Oath Keepers. They've also exercised in a peacekeeper role, not only at this Oregon mine, but also at the Bundy Ranch. Brandon was at both of those places, and they also did that in Ferguson. But when they protected people's property, when they showed up as peacekeepers to stand there to keep the, uh, the rioters from burning these buildings, they were told to leave. They were threatened by law enforcement. And of course, we reported, as our reporters were there, uh, Joe Biggs and Jakari Jackson were there, they were showing us how the police would pull back and allow the rioters to destroy. That is a policy that goes beyond just this Baltimore mayor. They want to get the Oath Keepers out of the way. They want to get the people out of the way so that they can go on with their PR stunt. They've got a riot to film, and that's what they want to have happen. But of course, there's other troubling aspects that we see about this kind of propaganda that's being used to divide and conquer the population here, divide us into a race war. And of course, we see the Obama administration now fighting for the right to use a cell phone kill switch. That's another way that you can make sure that no other narrative other than the one that you want to craft with the mainstream media gets put out. That's precisely what's behind this. Let's look at the history of this. This is something, as uh, Al Jazeera points out, that goes back about 10 years to 2005. They say for nearly a decade, Homeland Security has maintained a policy for unilaterally shutting down private cell phone service over an entire metropolitan area, if necessary, in the event of a national crisis. This is something that's called Standard Operating Procedure 303, or SOP 303. That's the cell phone kill switch. Now, they point out this went back to the 2005 London subway bombings, 7-7 uh, bombings. And if you remember, of course, we know that was a false flag. Among other things, they had set up a training operation in exactly the same place at exactly the same time with exactly the same scenario. And the next day, they actually interviewed the uh, people who were involved with that. The private security firm said, we were really surprised. We didn't know whether it was real or whether it was part of our exercise because it was exactly the same way. Of course, they did that at 9-11 as well. That's what many people are concerned about with Jade Helm as with any military exercise. We've seen this trick played so many times. That's what concerns us whenever we see an exercise like that. But again, going back to the 2005 London subway attacks, after that happened, they point out, New York City's Hudson River commuter tunnels had their cell phone service disconnected for almost two weeks. It was an unprecedented shutdown, they say. And then it ring, brings up the question as to who precisely has the authority to shut down your cell phone service. That's the question. That's what a lot of people are trying to find out. That's what Epic and others are trying to get the government to tell them. But of course, the government won't say. One of the people trying to get this information from Epic says, what we're asking for is really just high-level stuff. We're not asking for detailed information about how SP-303 works. We want to know what the rationale and the policy guidelines are. Understanding a public policy, he says, should not compromise national security. Ah, but it does. 
in a secretive police state that we have now. Everything must be hidden from the people. That's what should concern you the most. And they finish by saying, ask to explain the decision to withhold even basic procedural information and policy directives about SP, SOP 303. A Department of Homeland representative said, we have no comment on this. And that comment speaks volumes because that's where we are in America. We have a government that is operating secretly for the most part because what they're doing is criminal and we know that it's criminal. Now, in an article on The New American, they ask, why is President Obama prohibiting veterans from owning guns? Actually, that's a question from Senator Chuck Grassley, Republican of Iowa. He's asking why nearly all the people who have been flagged as being mental defectives are veterans. He wrote a letter to the Attorney General, Eric Holder, who is on his way out. This is part of the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, NCIS. And this is the mental defective category. Now, Congress has passed laws, and we have not uh, looked at the constitutionality of those laws in much detail yet, unfortunately, but they've passed their laws mandating that all federal agencies report the names of individuals to the NICS if they think that they fit into the mental defective category. Now, inclusion on this list prohibits you from ever owning or possessing a gun. And of course, there can't be one in your household, so by extension, everyone in your household is prohibited from having their Second Amendment rights. They say this is a legal standing that guides when a name is supposed to be reported to the mental defective category is whether the individuals are a danger to themselves or others. However, the Department of Veteran Affairs, the VA, the VA hospitals, they do not support such findings. Instead, the VA reports individuals to the gun ban list if an individual merely needs financial assistance managing benefits from the VA. And they point out the data published by the Congressional Research reveals that in 2012, the VA was responsible for 99.3% of all mental defective referrals to the NICS. You understand? That is nearly 100%. 99.3% are veterans that are being flagged by the VA so that they lose their Second Amendment rights. Perhaps they are afraid of veterans, just as they say they are in their scenarios. They say the people that they find most threatening are veterans, Christians, libertarians, constitutionalists, people who believe in small government, people who believe in the Constitution. That should not make you an enemy of the state. It should not mean that you lose your constitutional rights. But the VA is, is doing that to our veterans. We see a little bit of pushback. We've now had one more state that has signed legislation to resist the militarization of cops. It was just a few weeks ago that we saw in New Jersey that Chris Christie, the governor there, signed into law a bill that bans local law enforcement agencies from obtaining night scopes, military assault rifles, grenade launchers, and 14-ton mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicles, MRAPs, in other words, through a federal program without local oversight. And, of course, that federal program is the 1033 program. And if you remember, it was last summer that they stopped an equivalent program. It wasn't called the Section 1033 program, but there was a program that provided surplus military equipment to rural firefighters for over 60 years. At the same time, they couldn't get enough of these MRAPs into the hands of small town police forces. They wanted to completely shut off this program that had provided surplus military equipment to small fire departments to fight fires. And of course, they need help because they're on the front lines of massive rural areas and they have very small budgets. So they truly did need that surplus equipment. This equipment is not needed, and as we saw in many places, in New Hampshire, for example, we saw a veteran who said, you are equipping the police in this small, peaceful town far better than we were equipped in Fallujah. And of course, the police chief said he needed that because they had people that were very active in that area, like libertarians. They made it very clear it was for political protest. So a couple of weeks ago, New Jersey put a limit on this type of activity, and now we see, according to the Tenth Amendment Center, that Montana's governor has now signed a bill into law that would heavily diminish the effect of federal programs that militarize local police. Just understand that just as we saw today in the meeting that was in Bastrop, and they had a second meeting, we're going to talk to Jakari Jackson and Joe Biggs right after the break, but they had a meeting again, this time to address the public's concern during the day. They had already met privately with the county commissioners very quietly, as they did throughout uh, the Southwest, in terms of operating Jade Helm, in terms of getting a rubber stamp from these county commissioners, 
They had another meeting today. It was purely propaganda. And I would say that when we look at what they're telling us they need this training for, we need to remember how this training has been used abroad, perhaps in ways that we don't want it to be used in abroad. We know that it is something that can easily be used here in America. We see an infrastructure of tyranny coming up with the NDAA, saying the military can retain indefinitely, without trial, anybody that the president labels. And of course, he says, as he signs it, I have no intention of doing that. Then why would you create the ability to do that? Are we going to be ruled by angels? Of course we aren't. That's why we need to have a law that puts checks upon the misuse of power. Instead, we have laws that invite the misuse of power. And we have training exercises that play this out in front of our very eyes. That's what's going on with Jade Helm. But I want to go back to our history just briefly before we go to the break. The School of the Americas is still exporting death squads. You heard a lot about this a few decades ago, how Central American death squads were trained by the American military. That is still going on. And when that is going on in other countries, when they are running psyops, when they're running unconventional warfare, when they are invading countries and then putting down resistance, calling that asymmetric warfare, when they run death squads, torture squads, as we've seen the Senate uh, Intelligence Committee give a green light to, give a, uh, not even a, a hand slap to the people who are involved in this. Whistleblowers like John Kiriakou, who pointed out, go to prison, yet you see that General Petraeus, who leaks confidential information, gets probation. But let's go back to the School of the Americas. South American militaries have been sending soldiers to the U.S. for ethics and for human rights training for years. But we find out that in many cases they've been trained and they have produced some of the most notorious tortures and murders. Now they point out that this is no longer called the School of the Americas. It has now been given a different name. It's now called the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation. Wine sec, I guess we could call it. This is now in Fort Benning, Georgia. They were expelled from Panama in 1984. The School of the Americas relocated to Fort Benning, Georgia, and changed their names in 2001. Now, according to their site, their website, these values are imparted through a three-lesson ethics program, as well as the Democracy and Human Rights Program. Nevertheless, what we find are CIA and U.S. Army manuals that detail torture techniques translated into Spanish, utilized by the School of the Americas, and they say in this article, it's a far cry from anything containing human rights protections. Indeed, as SOA Watch explains, these manuals advocated torture, extortion, blackmail, and the targeting of civilian populations. Now, if you read the briefs of what unconventional warfare is, and that is what these people are training for, and of course, if they're not going to uh, train for martial law here in America, if they were merely going to do this abroad, this is precisely what they're training for. And we need to ask what the real mission of our military should be. Should they be given carte blanche? Should they have unlimited amounts of money, no oversight or question as to what their mission is? No. If we allow a permanent standing army to continue to do this, as, as Madison said, the means of defense abroad have always become the means of tyranny at home. And that is precisely what is going to happen. We're going to talk right after the break to Joe Biggs and Jakari Jackson, who attended the public meeting today. They're going to give us their take on the public's reaction to Jade Helm and to the PSYOP that we saw begin unfolding today in Bastrop, Texas, just outside of Austin. Stay with us. We'll be right back. My name is Alex Jones. Most of you know me from my syndicated radio program and my documentary films, as well as InfoWars Nightly News. When I got on air 20 years ago, I had discovered the globalist program, their plan to take over the world, and my focus went from running six miles every other day, swimming two, three miles a couple times a week, and lifting weights to focusing on fighting the globalist. I've gone from 279 pounds all the way down to 235 pounds and the weight's going off even faster. 
Super Male Vitality, Survival Shield X2 Nascent Iodine, and Oxy Powder. Those three products of the entire family of InfoWarsLife.com products are the most important from my own personal experience. And it wasn't just that my weight loss accelerated, my muscle mass increased, my stamina, my energy levels exploded. Now is the time to take action. Start your journey today with the Alex Challenge Pack. It's the trifecta of change. Secure yours today and get free shipping for a limited time at InfoWarsLife.com or 888-253-3139. The knowledge of the ancients, tried and true, trusted herbs and extracts fused with the latest nutraceutical science. Introducing the all-new Ancient Defense Herbal Immunity Blend, crafted with over 14 key ancient herbs and extracts to supercharge and prepare your body for what experts admit is the most dangerous season of the year. We have rejected hundreds of other formulations in our quest to bring you what is simply the most powerful and comprehensive proprietary formula that we have ever created in the realm of herbal immunity. For the last two years, our team has been working with top doctors, nutritionists, and chemists to develop the ultimate nutraceutical formulation. Experience the benefits of combining over 14 ancient herbs and extracts with exciting new advances in nutraceutical science. For a limited time, get 25% off on this introductory offer. Visit ancientdefense.com or call 888-253-3139. Ancientdefense.com. All right, sir, can you tell me what your name is, where you're from, and what brought you out here today? My name is Daniel Duclu. I'm from Bastrop, Texas. I uh, went to school in Austin, um, and I'm a concerned uh, American, Texan, Bastropian. Uh, I just think the government should be held accountable to the decisions they make, and I think it's our it's our privilege and uh, it's it's our duty as Americans to ask questions about what our government's doing. These are elected officials, um, or our judges, um, not the not the uh, guy with the army, but um, you know I think it's our duty to hold them accountable. So. Okay, we're here with Kathy Glass. You ran for governor this past election. And I was very surprised to see you come out here for this Jade Helm. Why is it so significant to you? Well, uh, my husband and I have a small ranch in McDade. So we live uh, half a life in Houston and half a life out here in uh, Lee County, actually. So what's happening in Bastrop is very important to us. But it's important to all Texans. This is not just a local thing going on. You're going to talk about uh, talking about the drill? Jade Helm, i stop. We're still doing ground rules, correct? Yeah, I'm still going to. Okay, all right. Jade Hillman Bastrop. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Anything else? How many questions are you going to ask? Do you ask everybody how many questions they're going to ask? She asked you several. I'm asking you how many questions do you plan on asking? Let's say I'll stop at five max. Five max. Three? Three. Three. Let's go three. All right. I just have you uh, say and spell your name and position. Lieutenant Colonel Mark Lastoria, Director of Public Affairs, United States Army Special Operations Command. All right, Colonel, uh, you spend a lot of time answering questions, so I'm trying not to be redundant, but just in the most general soundbite sense, what is Jade Helm? Mm-hmm. Jade Helm is a training exercise to produce top quality uh, U.S. Army Special Operations Forces for operations overseas, future operations overseas. Okay. And you had a lot of uh, concern here today. Is it fair to say? There, there were a lot of questions asked here today, and uh, I was really supportive of that. I think local governance is a fantastic thing, and uh, much like the uh, the judge said, it'd be great if uh, everybody came out in force like that to all of their meetings. Local governance is where things happen. Okay. Well, that wasn't really a question. It's more of a statement, but I'll try to be as uh, concise as possible. I just had a question about Metris Global and Thomas Mead, I believe, are involved in this operation. I'm sorry, who? Metris Global and Thomas Mead. I'm not familiar with... What was the first thing again? Metris Global. No, I'm not familiar with that. Thomas Mead. Thomas Mead, he is a coordinator for the exercise. All right, I'm here with Zizi Arnetta, former InfoWars reporter. You are here, you asked a question. What do you think about this Jade Helm operation and also their response to it? Well, overall, I think I'm mostly disappointed in the way that they let the public know. I found out about it uh, from the Bastrop County paper on the internet, and it was coming out the same time it came out on InfoWars. It's like they're saying one thing and then they're saying another thing at the same time out of both sides of their mouth, so it's confusing. Yes. Uh, when you're talking about putting people in civilian clothing, I just do not understand what that matters since this is supposed to be about foreign territory. I was just concerned with the uh, increasing indications that the military is getting a little too involved with local law enforcement. Uh, first of all, 
uh, we got this military assault vehicle that uh, assigned to our sheriff's department. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, all these strange things happening, coming in here like the, this military uh, operation, which is not new for our county because we have Camp Swift and I have helicopters flying over my property all the time. I don't have any problem with that. Uh, the thing that the indications that are happening that they're getting so involved that it does appear there is some martial law intent. You know, I think uh, one concern of mine is, well, first of all, I grew up here. I know Camp Swift is a big military base, so I, I am used to seeing people in uniform, and I have utmost respect for people in uniform and, and their sacrifice. Um, I think what concerns me the most is I'm a, I'm a student of history, um, and I, I know that mil the governments go tyrannical. And I know that also our, our government, um, through the Homeland Security, uh, through the Homeland Security um, has, has labeled people um, like the kinds of people that live in Bastrop that are conservative, gun owners, uh, libertarians, um, veterans, um, the government's labeled those people as potential terrorists. Um, and so I do see an odd correlation between a, you know, a huge military buildup and a hostile designation for the state of Texas um, in this area. I mean, it's not happening up in Washington, D.C. Now, with what you heard today, do you think there should be any type of recourse for the public to have their voices heard as far as canceling the drill? If enough public outcry came about, do you think they should cancel the drill? Uh, certainly, I think so. Uh, the, the problem I have with today's uh, get-together is it was one-sided, okay? Uh, we were allowed to ask questions. We were not allowed, except spontaneously, to express our dissatisfaction. And I think it's an obligation on the people making the presentation and the county commissioner's court to understand why the people feel the way they do and why it appears, but whether it is or not, it appears to be the implementation of martial law. Of course they should, and that, there will be another county commissioner's meeting, and if this can be put on the agenda, then they can force another vote. Maybe it'll be the same way, but I think at least one of the commissioners would have to put it on the agenda, and then it can be voted on after the information has come forth. That's the way it should be. That's the whole point, isn't it? Are we supposed to be able to vote? We weren't even told. People here in this county weren't told. I didn't even know that it was already voted on. I was coming up the stairs and someone had said that and I, I was so shocked. I'm like, what do you mean? People are just finding out about it. So yeah, this is a seriously messed up. You know, we're a democracy, but we're, you know, we're a democratic republic. So we hire, we hire representatives to, to listen to the majority, but also protect the rights of the minority. So, um, you know, if no one's rights are being violated, then people have the right to do what they want to do. And the military has the right to practice drills. Um, but at the same time, I'm not quite sure um, that our rights are be being pr protected. Um, so I think it's the job of our elected officials to protect our rights. Um, the only thing I would say is this is uh, taking place on private land. And I understand that people may have concerns, um, but that private landowner has their rights as well, too. And they, uh, not only in their word, but also in their deed, support you, the U.S. Army and Army Special Operations Command. And we're thankful for that. And I believe you said most of it's going to be on private land, or did you say all of it's going to be for on Bastille private County, land? County, it's all on private land. There's a reason that people have problems with this, and those are, it's not irrational fears, it's well-founded fears. And if you're talking about this new warfare, this asymmetrical warfare, well, these gentlemen that came need to learn that what you need in those situations is the, the backing of the populace. They're, they need to buy into that. They need to support you. And if there's one thing that this training exercise should have told them right now, one thing they should have already learned, is that they do not have the backing of the people for this exercise. They blew it. They blew an opportunity. They came in as though they were occupying force uh, and were just being um, kind to answer our questions. No, they should have been courting us and answering us. And maybe there would have been a different outcome for this meeting if they'd come in with a different attitude. Joining us tonight are Joe Biggs and Jakari Jackson. They were at the Jade Helm meeting in Bastrop. Of course, this is a meeting that was held because so many people have contacted local government. They're concerned about it. They brought a colonel down to give a PR show. And I would say that's what it is. It looked pretty much just like uh, propaganda, like a PSYOP. Uh, what, what's your impression of it? Well, I, I pretty much agree with that statement. What this was, they made it very clear from the beginning, the commissioner, he said at the outset, this is not a meeting to set policy. We're just here to hear the concerns of the public. 
which they did hear. They heard the concerns of the public. They but they could them. care less. Yeah, and then I'm, I'm sure they'll throw them in a drawer and not really do anything. Yeah. And one yeah. of the ladies at the end, towards the end of the uh, discussion, she asked the question, since you see so many people who are against this, or at least not necessarily for it, they may be kind of on the fence, can we you know, postpone it or just cancel it altogether? To which the commissioner replied that, you know, we decided that he asked the commissioner that it was fine and he really had no plans to change that. So it seems that their elected officials out there in Bastrop are not doing what's in the preferred interest of the people out there. Yeah, because yeah. as they kept trying to uh, reiterate during the meeting, they're using mostly private lands that they're not paying for. You know, That was something that I heard that I thought was amazing. Of course, I haven't seen most of what happened because mm -hmm. we were just checking in with you at, at random on mm -hmm. the radio program today as it was live. But at one point where they brought this on, the, uh, the colonel said, these are people who have private property who came to us and asked us to do this. And it's like, are you kidding me? I mean, that's the most outrageous, ridiculous, ball-faced lie I've ever heard. Nobody called up the uh, special forces and said, I'd like to have a training exercise on my property. Who can I talk yeah, to to arrange said, this? I mean, that's ridiculous. It's kind of a word-of-mouth thing that eventually got around. Word-of-mouth, yeah. Yeah, right. there, there was a guy sitting beside me in the little pew or whatever you want to call it. And uh, he said, as soon as the, uh, the Lieutenant Colonel Mark Lestory, I believe is his name, as soon as he said that, <laughs> he leaned over to me and goes, that's complete and total BS. Yes, man. yes. And I said, and I said well, how is. do you know that? He goes, well, I actually own property that corners a property that has, uh, I think it's like 20 acres, uh, something like that, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And she was approached, the lady that lives yes. next door to him, mm -hmm. was approached by these Jade Elm mm -hmm. architects, Thomas Mead, the uh, Metrics Global. Uh, well, let's understand the way they do this, okay? They say they've been invited by the local governments as well. What do they do? They come in there with uniforms or anything, appeal to their patriotism and say, we want to hold this exercise here. We need it to train our troops. We need an invitation from you. And then they come back and they say, well, we were invited, you know, as if, the other people initiated it, which is not the, tr the case at all, certainly not in this well, particular Well, they said that everyone's known about this for months on end, but why are people just now finding out about it? We brought it to the surface, yeah. and now people are just now hearing about it, and everyone in the entire uh, meeting were like, yeah, why are you said that this is, you know, this has been public knowledge forever, but you've never promoted it in any way, and that's what's pissing off people. The it was fact hidden that when we reported on it, when we reported on it, uh, Drudge put it up. Mm -hmm. He also linked to the scribed document, and then they tried to get a comment from the military, and the military said, I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't seen it. I can't look at that. I can't go to that site. Well, can't go to that site because they shut down. But he could have gone to scribed and looked at it at scribed, but of course he didn't. So first their technique was to say, well, you know, it, uh, it, it it's not an issue. You know, it, it doesn't exist. And then they want to come back and say, we've been doing this all along. That's well, not true. Well, they said either. they denied. Remember at the beginning, they denied the slides. Like, we don't know yeah. where these slides yes, come from. Exactly. And then today they read off of the slides, the exact same slides yeah, that we originally posted. That's all the briefing was, was 20 minutes of this lieutenant colonel reading verbatim these slides. He left off the suspicious activity in the other parts, but- I think know, a hostile territory was the phrase not used. Yeah, he never yeah, said, he said yeah. the, the two targeted areas or something like that. It was really weird. So you, yeah, when you look at their map, you're either hostile or you're permissive. And I think that's basically the way the federal government views all of us here in America. And then, you're either permissive and you bend over and let them do whatever they want to do, or you are hostile and you need to be taken out. And, but that's the amazing thing. People were asking them questions about the slides, and he pretended like they didn't exist, like he'd never seen them. And, of course, then today he reads off. Well, there was a question that I asked, and if you want, we should take a look at this yeah, clip. Yeah, let's take a look at that. Our next question from before. Hey, I'm Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs, U.S. Army, retired, Infowars.com. And I have a question. You said your training will be to blend in um, for overseas combat missions. So I'm kind of curious how these special operations guys who look like us, look like him, are going to be practicing blending in when we all look the same. Don't they need to train in an area overseas for the combat they're going to go to? Because that, quite frankly, doesn't make sense to me from my time in the military because you guys have Fort AP Hill in Virginia, the Asymmetric Warfare Center, that has a school, a soccer field, a subway station, a bank, all that, and you're training on these environments which look like here. That's why people are concerned. Excellent question. So with that, realistic military training occurs off of the federal installation out in the local area. That's what we're doing. As far as blending in, yeah, you take a guy from uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, I dress differently than people dress here. It's regional. It's one of those. I've been in Fort Bragg. I was for seven years. You may not like the answer, but that is, that is how it is. And you may have been at Fort Bragg, and people dress differently in and around the 10 surrounding counties, and you've seen it. 
the 10 surrounding counties, people dress differently. And you've seen how soldiers <laughs> dress. And you can sticker about it all you want. Okay. That is the truth. Okay, that's all you want. And the thing about that was I asked a similar question, as did many other people. If you're trying to blend in overseas, why are you in Bastrop, Texas? You know, and, and as, the, as the gentleman was saying, you know, we dress differently in different parts of the country. So I'm not sure, you know, what Russians they expect to be out there in Cowboys. So his one word answer to you was plumbing. Yeah. Right? yeah I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, uh, and, that's and, all you know trying to be respectful to the guy as I can because I do respect his service. But I just felt that he wasn't really there to answer people's questions. He was more there to read off cue cards. And it was like the Delphi technique. You yeah. know, it's yes. they oh, had the outcome that they wanted to have. They weren't going to change that. They just allowed you to go. It's really more of a venting session. Mm -hmm. Go out there, vent on the record so you can say, yeah, I went to the thing and I, I feel good about it. But they were still going to run the drill. Yeah, people were calling out the colonel. Uh, there was one guy who was ex-special forces that had served under there and said that these guys are liars. You can't believe anything that they say. Uh, there was a few guys that approached me that were spe uh, special ops that were like, you know, this is out of control. This is nothing like that I ever did while I was in. Yeah, this that's the key out. thing. If you look at the number of people that showed up, they were upset about this. And, of course, there were a lot of people who were upset about this. They couldn't go today because they held this meeting during the day, not during the evening. I think that backfired on them, though. Yeah. Because they had it scheduled where they announced it to be at 9 o'clock in the morning, and then me and Big show up, they said we pushed it to 11. So I guess they are expecting people to leave, but people didn't leave. They no. called their buddies and said, hey, come on down here. They're having the meeting at 11. <laughs> The place yeah. was jam-packed. It was standing room. Yeah, home. I mean, the, the the judge even said, you know, I'm shocked at the fact this many people came out. And I'm sitting there thinking, why? Everyone's mad. No one wants this here. You've heard people for the past hour yes. verbally speak their minds about how they don't want this here at all. Even people who don't even watch our show had no idea what mm -hmm. InfoWars was. Mm -hmm. Just based off what they knew, what they could find on the Internet, we're completely against it off of that. Yes, absolutely. But the fact that you had so many people there hmm. makes it obvious that it's a lie that this is something they do all the time. This is not something they do all the time. People can look at this and say, this is not standard operating procedure, and we don't want it to become standard operating procedure. I mean, this is not something that the military has been doing all along. This is stepping it up, just as we're seeing all these increased drills in all the different cities, just as we saw in Fort Myers, where they went in at night with a helicopter, they march people out in single file, put them into white vans and drive them off, I guess, to a simulated prison or whatever. We don't want that happening in our country. And we know that with the indefinite detention that Obama signed, he says, don't worry, I'm not going to do it. We're just going to train for it, evidently. Yeah. Okay, That's what they're doing now. Not only did he then sign that into law, creating a quote-unquote legal infrastructure, although you know it should be challenged and it could be easily thrown out if we had anybody in government that uh, believed in the Constitution, Nevertheless, they pretend that they're creating a legal structure for this kind of stuff, and now we see them training for that, and as we saw it in AP Hill, as you mentioned to him. You know, a lot of people were upset with the fact that people were bringing it up, not the colonel, but people were bringing up why are we being labeled as hostile in Texas and Utah, and he goes, well, we, we wanted to come to Texas because Texas is very welcoming of our military exercise. We've had these for 25 years. This is nothing new. I was like, well, if that's the case, and for the past 25 years, you'd have a lot of pissed off people coming to these meetings, but no one's ever been to one because no one's ever known about it. They haven't been at this size and scale. They That's haven't right. gone on for two That's months. Right. They haven't, in, uh, you know, it hasn't been the Green Berets, the Navy SEALs, uh, Marine Expeditionary Fighting Forces, ex, uh, 82nd Airborne, U.S. Air Force Special Operations. This is excessive. Yeah. This is huge. Yeah. And the yeah. implementations of what this is going to be is what's scaring people. People are on edge. Yes. And that's one of the gentlemen brought up in the meeting he asked the colonel a question because he kept repeating that line that we've trained at, you know, AP Hill or whatever other place. So we wanted to go someplace different because we know those terrains like the back of our hands. And one of the gentlemen stood up and he said, you know, conservatively, you guys have hundreds of thousands of acres of land owned by the U.S. government. Why can't you train there? Yeah. You know, and there's, you know, really no good answer for that. They want to get in your face. This is part of the PSYOP. And of course, if anybody bothers to look up the definition, just go to Wikipedia and look at the definitions on Wikipedia. Uh, and they've got, uh, they take their definitions from the Department of Defense. Look at what they say unconventional warfare is. It's psychological operations. It's going in and using deceit to try to control the, the people who are in leadership in a community so they control, control the rest of the people. That's what it's about, and that's a large part of what this is about. Well, one psyop. of the questions someone that's asked it. from downstairs, I believe, it came up on a little cue card, was that would there be any kind of training for detaining uh, civil dissonance, you know, people... Mm -hmm. out here, any kind of roundups, and he said, no, nothing like that would happen. And then you asked a more specific version, which I thought was better. 
tell them kind of. Well, hold on. Let's get to the clip. Uh, first of all, uh, sir, could I have you two gentlemen just my camera? What's your name, sir? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Chikari Jackson, InfoWars.com. Um, oh, thank you. Anyway, um, for the two gentlemen, can you guys just for the camera state your names and uh, positions again? I'll state my name. I'm sure. the spokesman for United States Army Special Operations Command. I'm the guy giving the brief. Yes, sir. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Mark Lestore. I'm the Director of Public Affairs, United States Army Special Operations Command, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Okay. Now we're talking about role players, and you mentioned the role players. So I'm curious as to how you guys came about these role players, and also will there be any drills to round up and or detain the role players? As far as the role players go, they are going to be service members, and if there's an incident like that, it's going to be within the scope of the exercise for unconventional warfare for future operations overseas. Yeah. Oh, will anybody be detained or rounded up in the it, exercise? It's possible. It's for future operations overseas. So in the, in the uh, Convention of Unconventional Warfare, all right, there could be a point where it goes kinetic. So, and then you have to execute actions on the objective. Well, I, I guess we keep coming back to the same question. How are these guys going to blend in overseas? I mean, and at night. It all starts from the basics. Okay, we don't just go and say run. You got to crawl, you got to walk, and then you're running. So to start blending in, and we do it back here. We start picking up things that will apply later on. Hey, I do need to pay attention to certain types of shoes. These aren't available over here. And like I said before, and people were, were disagreeing with me, they dress differently in Fayetteville, North Carolina. They just do. It's bizarre. And by the time I had a chance to ask my question, I had noticed that people had asked this, a similar question, but in a different way. So I said, well, let me ask it this way and see how he responds. And then I asked him, you know, where are these role players coming from? And also, are you planning to detain, indoor, you know, round up these people in your role playing uh, scenario? And he said, it's a possibility. Yeah. Well, well, we know it's a possibility because we've got recordings from when they. Uh, went to another uh, county in Texas, and they were talking about how the helicopters are going to fly in from Louisiana. They're going to come in at three or four in the morning. They would only be there for 15 minutes because they're coming in to extract, uh, you know, the, these <laughs> these people here. I, you know, I think that's exactly what they're going to do. Exactly what we saw in uh, Fort Myers. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the interesting things though that I thought was when he asked that question, he looks over that Thomas, the Thomas Mead guy, and that's the guy who's like really running this entire thing. And I think, like you said earlier, due to some other recordings that he had, they didn't want him to talk this time. Mm -hmm. But the lieutenant colonel looks over and he says, are we going to round up, like, are we going to do that to anyone in Bastrop? And he goes, no, 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 but maybe somewhere else kind of like that. And it was really <laughs> weird how he said that. And when people would ask, like, more specific questions, he would always look at Thomas over there standing there, who never really said anything the whole time. All he did was just look, make eye contact, give a nod or, like, throw up, you know, like a number or something. <laughs> And that was it's it. Kind of, like, kind of like a baseball coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, you're kind of messing up. You're on track. Yeah, he was yeah. the coach, all right. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Here's here's the situation. Okay. We know that there's dual use for all these exercises. Yeah, exactly. Right. But the question and, and and the comments seem to be out there about are we happy with what our government is doing abroad? As Rand Paul has pointed out, every time we go in and overthrow one of these third world dictators, we wind up with Islamic fundamentalists who are very radical in their place. We've turned Libya after we got rid of Qaddafi who hadn't been causing any problems for decades, basically he'd been quiet. Now that place is essentially a training camp for ISIS. Okay? And one of the things the gentleman kept bringing up was a nation building. And nobody yes. asked him a question about yes. this, but uh, he kept bringing that up. And I, and I was thinking, you know, like, do we really want to continue all this nation building? Look at these nations we supposedly have built up in the chaos that still ensues there. Is that, exactly, is that what we want to do? Do we want to have a U.S. military? Does that enhance us as a country? Does that increase our safety? Okay, does it make us more financially viable to pay for this massive military that we're not allowed to question without having our patriotism questioned? Okay, we're supposed to give a blank check to the federal government, to the military, to basically take down country after country and then fight against the people who are, are, are rising up against us as occupiers. That's what this unconventional asymmetric warfare is everywhere. And we've seen the uh, School of the Americas, as I mentioned in the, uh, in the news earlier, we've seen how decades ago that was being used to train uh, death squads in Central America. Uh, Pinochet's Chile was using that. And of course, we had the Savak in Iran. If anybody wants to know why they chant death to America all the time, go back and read the history of what we did with the CIA with the Savak in Iran. Do we want to continue this kind of uh, process where we're training to torture people, to extract people, 
to uh, have these regimes of terror in countries that we have taken down because the military industrial complex wants it, because we've got a guy in a suit sitting over there giving hand signals to the military. That's essentially what this is about. No, that's a very good point, David. And I, that's something I want to mention. Uh, I guess we're getting close here to the close. Uh, he was talking about the uh, the map of Jade Helm, and something that he mentioned was that it was supposed to be a, a simul simulation of, uh, I guess, some type of foreign country. And he said, you know, it's supposed to be a, a, a you know water surrounded country. And I was out there thinking, I was like, well, why would you do such a thing in a place like Texas? Well, especially this high up in Texas, where you really don't have a lot of water to play around in in the first place. Yeah. You know, so it, you know, there's yeah. a lot of questions that I don't think were sufficiently answered, but I think it's just more or less, you know, a thing to read off the cue cards. Yep. You train the way you're gonna fight. You train to in exactly the scenario. And they said that in LA when people questioned them. So why are you doing this in the city? And it's like, well, we train the way we fight. If we're gonna fight in the mountains, we would train there, we'd fight in the desert, we train there. And it's like, yeah, well, that doesn't answer the question. It just raises a lot more, more. questions. Yeah. And so did this press conference. Thank you so much, Shakari Jackson and Joe Biggs. We'll be right back after the break. We're going to have an interview with a man who has been both at the Bundy Ranch and is now at the Oregon mining situation. Stay with us. We'll be right back. From the water table to our soils to the atmosphere itself, our world is becoming more and more toxic each and every day. But it's not just the air outside that's toxic. Indoor air has been shown to have two to five times higher concentrations of pollutants than even outdoor air. And most Americans spend 90% of their time inside using toxic chemicals within their homes. There are more than 42 million smokers in the United States. Well over a thousand types of mold and mildew linked to numerous conditions. And don't forget the fact that six million Americans live with pets they're allergic to as well. When I began to research these statistics, it was clear to me it was time to start cleansing my lungs in order to combat the toxic environment that we cannot escape but that we can fight back against. Made with organic and wild cultivated herbs and manufactured in the USA, the new InfoWars Life Lung Cleanse is here in a convenient spray bottle that can be brought with you throughout any toxic environment. Now available exclusively at InfoWarsLife.com or by calling toll-free 888-253-3139. InfoWars Life and InfoWarsLife.com is extremely excited to announce our latest release, Winter Sun, a revolutionary type of vitamin D3. Winter Sun is a premium quality vitamin D3 nutritional supplement. It is produced by extracting oil from healthy, nutrient-dense plants known as lichens. Every batch is analyzed for purity and D3 content. It's completely free of toxins and allergens. Simply put, if you want the best at an extremely low price, this is it. Winter Sun is the result of our pursuit of the best source of vitamin D3. The research and development took over two years, but the result, as verified by independent laboratories, is the best vegan vitamin D3 product in the world. Read the facts at InfoWarsLife.com about Winter Sun Vitamin D3. Not only does vitamin D3 promote a healthy mood, but vitamin D supports our memory and brain function, something the globalists are targeting. Visit InfoWars.com today or call 888-253-3139. Did you know that only six corporations control 90% of what millions of Americans see, hear, and read every single day? It's the illusion of choice. Think about it. The mainstream media is owned by only a handful of mega corporations with vested interests. But on the other hand, the internet is an interconnected network of billions of sources. So you can research information for yourself from multiple sources, or you can blindly accept what you hear or read in the mainstream media, never questioning what you are being told. This gives you a false sense of reality. I mean, do you actually know what you think you know? Or have you been programmed to accept someone else's version of events? Think about it. This is Darren McBreen, and I want you to break the matrix at InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.tv and listen to The Alex Jones Show, because there's a war on in your mind. Tonight, we're going to talk to Brandon Rapola. He's a veteran, he's a oath keeper, and he's a modern day Minuteman who's come to the aid several times to people when they needed help. Of course, he was at the Bundy Ranch, and he is now at the uh, mine in Oregon where there was concern that the BLM this last Saturday 
was going to take over the mine very precipitously without going through the legal process. The mining district there had spent $10,000 on legal fees trying to get an answer for why they had been given a deadline of last Saturday to clear out, to remove their equipment, to tear down their buildings, to fill up the mine that had been there for 150 years. They called for help, and the Oath Keepers answered that help. And as we've seen in multiple areas, their professionalism, their organization has brought peace to a lot of very tricky situations. So joining us now is Brandon Rapola. Thank you for joining us, Brandon, and thank you for doing what you're doing. Tell us why you do what you do. You've been at the Bundy Ranch as well as this gold mining standoff. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, um, uh, it, it's probably been probably about four years uh, of me, you know, coming kind of understanding of what's been going on in, in our nation. And um, really, honestly, it's a, uh, just a uh, understanding that I need to volunteer and give my time and give my energy to those who are in need um, and, and connecting with the people who see the same same things that are going on. And um, myself, I, I, I served in the Marine Corps from 92 to 96. And, um, you know, I think that my skill sets can be used and, and still, you know, a lot of us veterans, um, our oath never, never, ever expires. And we still continue to try to do our best to serve our communities however we can. Absolutely. I really appreciate you taking the time off. Uh, I mean, that's going to be a, a tremendous hardship. Take time away from your job or your business to go and do that. Um, Tell us what the situation there at the uh, the mining operation is now. And I referred to it as a standoff. It is not a standoff, as they've made clear at the Oath Keepers site, the, uh, the county Oath Keepers site. This is merely a security operation to make sure that time is given for the owners to have due process there uh, with the uh, BLM. But tell us what happened, because last Saturday, of course, was the deadline. The BLM had laid down this deadline and said, uh, get out, uh, get your equipment out, take your buildings down, fill up the holes in the mine that's been there for 150 years. Uh, that passed and uh, passed peace, peacefully, didn't it? Yes, yes. And, and it's it's something where uh, it was uh, two weeks ago uh, when they contacted the Oath Keepers and, and we had uh, looked over their uh, all of their uh, complaints against them from the BLM and then looked at uh, what they had for information and went through, uh, fortunate enough that the Oath Keepers, they had a legal team to be able to look at it and say, okay, okay this is uh, what they're doing is unlawful. And from that point, we went full operational and were able to go in and occupy um, assist the miners and providing the complete security for them to make sure that they were not to be harmed. Um, there's, you know, they have the threats, the threats against them and their building and, and, as a normal American citizen, you know, uh, who's out there, the everyday person who's blue collar to, uh, you know, the rancher, the miner to the logger, you know, uh, myself, I have a concrete company. I mean, we're just, you know, we, we work for every day. We have our families, we have, you know, we're, we're your neighbors and your, your friends next door. Absolutely. And, yeah. uh, it's just simply, they were being pushed around and, and, you know, I, I know nothing about ranching, and I know nothing about mining, and but I do know what's right and wrong and having some sort of moral ethic to it. Um, Absolutely, and that's the key thing. That was the key thing at the Bundy Ranch was I saw neighbors come together to stand with neighbors and say, we don't like what you're doing here. You're being violent with people. You're, taking, you're running all the ranchers out of business. But it was really the violence that had uh, taken place the previous couple of weeks, the fact that they had attacked people with dogs, with tasers. They'd attacked uh, a lady from behind. Uh, they were pointing sniper rifles at people. The neighbors said, this is enough. We want this to stop. Now, they made it very clear at the Josephine County uh, Oath Keepers uh, website. They said, this is not a standoff with the BLM. We are not promoting any confrontation with the BLM. This is a security operation for the protection of constitutional rights. And that's the important thing, is that we see these bureaucracies over and over again writing their own laws, do, being their own police, accusing you and taking you to their own courts. That's what the fundamental problem is, and it is far beyond even the uh, BLM. We have organizations that are doing this throughout the government. The EPA is doing it. The IRS has done this for a very long time. Virtually every bureaucracy in the federal government has been given a free license by the Congress to do whatever they wish, and that's the fundamental problem, I think. You know what, sir? I, I can't agree with you more. This is why... Myself, uh, you know, it, it, as being serving in the Marine Corps, like I said, as security forces uh, overseas, and then also a scout with Light Armored Recon Battalion, and you look at 
you know, your buddies, your friends, and, and you know, you, you're, you're standing for, you start understanding the, the Constitution, you start understanding what this, uh, what America has, what it was built on. But then you come home and, you know, you work, you figure, trying to figure out to fit in civilian life. And then you start developing it. You know, I'm 40 years old now, and I'm self-employed. And during this time, I look at the way that bureaucracies work. They're not in the American citizen's favor. They're in for their own. And, and as you – I was never – honestly, sir, I've never, ever been interested in politics, except for the last three or four years where I've just had enough, and I realize I have to get involved. And um, Well, as the saying goes, uh, if you're not interested in politics, that doesn't mean they're not interested in you. The politicians Absolutely. are very interested in you. And if we had more people who would, like you, Brandon, stand up for uh, their fellow man, to stand up for principles, we wouldn't have these kind of problems. Because as Clive and Bundy pointed out, every time people stand up for their rights, stand up with their neighbors for their neighbors' rights, then that improves. And we've seen that happen over and over again. Where it doesn't appear to work is when the government is able to come in and successfully divide and conquer, to say to people, uh, this doesn't concern you because this guy is a rich rancher. You were at the Bundy Ranch. I was at the Bundy Ranch. Is Clive and Bundy rich? <laughs> Absolutely not. And then that's, you know, when I'm in the hole, every time I've been in the hole, you're out, you know, I'm not ever seeing what's being said. And then when I, when I, you know, a week and a half, two weeks later, when I get back to life, I'm like, what? who's reporting this, all these lies? And yes, who's exactly. reporting all of this stuff where, the, you know, I when I was at, being at the Bundy from the, you know, for the time I was there, I, I was very adamant. I wanted to be involved with their personal, not their personal security, but when they go outside and uh, they're out in, uh, in the desert, I want to be there and I want to uh, see what they do and, and, and secure them during that time, but also see what their lives like. I mean, you have 16, you know, you know, teenage boys. And I can't see boys, young men. These are young men who, they do it the old school way. They got chaps. They have the reins. They have, you know, horses. They go out there and they, they round up what they need to round up. And, you know, they tend to the cattle and um, they actually work. There's no complaining. They they do what they got to do. And, you know, they work with their hands. And there's, you know, the, the sad thing is, is you look at the beat up trucks, you yes. know, their home is a <laughs> humble home and yes. their clothes are humble. They're they're. I mean, I, I look at them. I see me. Mm -hmm. And I look at these ranchers, uh, the, the the miners, and I see me. You know, we, you know, I have a, a, a 2002 Dodge Diesel, and you know, I don't. And I, you go to the BLM and you look at their new trucks, their new oh, yeah. equipment, their new gear, and I think this is this is what's criminal is when we are overtaxed and over uh, regulated that so much where they're living the high life and they had over a hundred. They had over 105 vehicles, uh, Brandon, at the Bundy Ranch, as you know. I, I, yeah. Clive said it was 105, 107. They counted it. Uh, all brand new vehicles with one person each in it. So you had this yep. ar new army and new cars driving around there. And of course, they were saying this was to protect the desert tortoise, yet they euthanized over a thousand desert tortoises because they said they didn't have the money to feed these desert tortoises. But yes. they had the money Absolutely. to find to fund a private army and uh, of, of uh, BLM agents as well as people who are going to rustle the cattle from the, the Bundys. Hey, sir, it's, it's completely, uh, um, they, they're, I mean, it's, it would be a great, I mean, if you hear anybody they're like, yeah, I want to work for the government because shoot, you get a high wage and your gear and equipment is top end. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, you, I mean, I'm coming from ca talking in the military. Our military doesn't have that. Our United States military, certain units that do not have that type of high end gear and equipment, you know, it's, Yes. You know, so I sit and I look at it, and I'm like, "This is this is nuts." Where, um, well, I'm back in North Carolina. I, I got to say, back in North Carolina, we did business, and a lot of our clients were a lot of small businesses, and these guys were going out of business. People couldn't find jobs, except for the people who worked for the government. If you worked yep. for the government at the state level, if you worked for the government at the federal level, it was boom time. And you got to yep. look at this and say, "What's wrong with this picture?" And of course. The common thing that's going on here at the Bundy Ranch, as well as in this mining area, is that all these small businessmen, and that's the way you need to understand what these people are. The Bundys are small businessmen. These uh, miners in this particular situation, the Galice Mining District, they are small businessmen who have a title that goes back 150 years. They're working under very uh, small-scale operations, and the government wants to clear them out. And once they clear all of them out, 
I think they're going to take these mines and these areas and they're going to turn it over to large foreign corporations. That's what we've seen over and over again. That's what's happening that in, in Arizona. Yeah, exactly. In Arizona and in California. And that's that's what's coming up is just, just the same thing as the Bundys. You had ranchers come and explain their story and their history. And I was baffled. I, you know, I, honestly, I came there unknown. I didn't know I was coming as a three percenter coming out of Oregon, you know, and solo. And then, and then seeing that, and that's when I realized I had to, I, you know, there's more things to come. And now, you know, I, I know nothing about mining, but to see it, and then you hear those miners that come to us and those families, and there are just, there are hardworking, honest individual people that they, they're coming and saying this, man, I, I was pushed out of my mind X amount of years ago. People from California and out of state, they're saying, hey, thank you guys. Thank you for somebody coming and step, stepping up. And that was kind of my message that I, that was very, that kind of, it was very adamant, my message for the Buddy Ranch. I did a few YouTube videos and telling people, you have to, as a community, come together in your local areas. You have to come together as neighbors. And that's the only way that we can stand together. Um, and then from there, if, if you're still getting pushed around, you need to ask for help. People will come. There are, I mean, the, the people that have, that I've met throughout that are from the Bundy Ranch and also here at the Miners, we're, there are a large, not all our veterans, and I tell you what, all those civilians that are out there, they're hunters, they're trackers, they're men of the woods, they're lumberjacks. They are, they are people that know those mountains and know those hills, and they're very skilled um, in those environments because of, of being raised in the Northwest or be, those guys that are being raised in the desert. These are, these are good good, hardworking men, but they also have skill sets. But what uh, the next thing is you get a lot of veterans, and these are combat veterans. These are combat MOS veterans that are sick and tired that we didn't, and we did not at all join and sacrifice our armed forces and watch many of these men have lost their best friends, lost, lost their brothers and sisters due to combat and the, the, the things that go on in the families to have to endure that, that those losses to come back here and see what this what the government wants to do to our American neighbors. We didn't. I didn't. I know I didn't serve to come back and abuse and turn my head away and let anybody else come and, and uh, uh, any bureaucracy come through and, and stomp on all, all over our citizens. And that's the thing is they don't realize we're not going to piss on the graves of our fallen fallen warriors from all the way back to the birth of our of our great nation just because it's uncomfortable or because it's not my my business. There's that you can let everybody know that's out there that there are, are veterans and uh, civilians, and you put us all together as just straight up Americans that will come and assist. And but you have to, you know, through the networking process, you have to get involved with each other and get get involved with others. And uh, after Bundy Ranch, I got involved with the Oath Keepers because I realized that what they stood for it was veterans and law enforcement. We have law enforcement personnel, we have state yeah. troopers, there's sheriffs. To all aspects of it, they really do believe in the oath. They really do believe in in uh, helping their neighbors, and really do believe that they are serving the community. And you uh, are serving the community. What I appreciate, Brandon, is how professional Oath Keepers has been, both here and at Ferguson and at the Bundy Ranch. We see that they come in as a calming effect. They have de-escalated things. That's precisely what they did at Josephine County. They said, "Please do not make any type of threatening phone calls to the local BM, uh, BLM, or U.S." FS, as that's the Forestry Service, as it undermines our mission and professionalism, and it's unwarranted. Nevertheless, when there was this rally at the end of last week, it was reported by KDRV that they had someone dispatched, the BLM had dispatched someone from the District of Columbia, from Washington, to talk to the press about that. And as he portrayed it, it sounded like they were closing the offices. He said uh, they did it as a precaution to protect the safety of the employees and the public. So they made you guys sound like you're some kind of a rowdy mob. That's exactly the tactic that the SPLC did last week with their headlines, although when they reprinted excerpts from their interviews in the text, you could see the text of the article, you could see that clearly nobody was threatening anybody uh, at the BLM from, from the Oath Keepers. Nevertheless, the headlines, the implications are that you're a bunch of rowdy yahoos. We've heard people on the Glenn Beck program uh, describe what happened at the Bundy Ranch as a bunch of rowdy yahoos who are spoiling for a fight. That's not the case at all. It's been very measured, Sorry. very professional, especially uh, at Ferguson as well. Thank, thank you, sir. Let me let me very also um, make it very clear. It comes from the leadership all the way from the top with Stuart Rhodes himself, and also the leadership from Joseph Rice in this Josephine County and those leaders that are there um, at, in Josephine County that um, 
um, in that area. But all, in addition to that, um, it, it's it's it, these are everybody there is very professional, and those and those teams that have come um, from all the three Idaho three percenters, uh, the uh, militias, individual militia groups from Washington, throughout Oregon, uh, Nevada. We have people from Michigan. We've had people Alabama, Florida, um, Arizona, uh, Montana. You get people that are concerned citizens, and w- the it's been very clear up front. And and I'm in charge of running the security operations in the man in the mine. That when people get vetted, when they come to me, I'm very clear and up front. And and you know what? It's been Along with being clear, you look at everybody's eyes and say, "Yes, that's we don't want to fight. Yes. We are here. Yes. We are here as as to make sure that these miners are safe, but also to make it very clear that Americans are out there. We are not scared to stand up. We are not scared to travel thousands of miles away to come for what is right." And- that's true. We're almost out of time, Brandon, and I want to briefly touch on Ferguson. Because I think there's some lessons to be learned from that as well. Because I think that was a failure uh, in the way that that happened. We've just seen in Baltimore the amazing admission from the mayor that looters were provided with an area to destroy if they wished, you know, to just vent their frustrations. Of course, they were destroying individual businesses. And I believe that's what happened to some degree in Ferguson as well. There was also an element of divide and conquer, trying to say, well, this is black versus white. It isn't simply trying to get your government under control. They didn't have any kind of professional leadership like we saw at the Bundy Ranch, like we saw at this mining situation, to keep things from getting out of hand. Nevertheless, they were, on the contrary, encouraged to let things get out of hand. But the Oath Keepers were in Ferguson. They were there to protect some small businesses, and they were doing it very peacefully. And the police had a problem with that. They They wanted them to leave and not protect those businesses. I thought that was very telling, especially when you look at the recent admission from the Baltimore mayor. Let me let me make that very clear also, because I was also a part of um, that, uh, that environment, and I was asked to, to go out there, but I was put on hot hold because uh, uh, things did calm down. But it was very clear, and, and those, uh, I, I know the leadership that's out there in Ferguson, and they are very outstanding in what they what they stand for. And, yes. and the, the key thing is people don't understand is the federal government wants the Oath Keepers because we are a professional uh, for the for the Constitution. They don't want us around. That's and right. And we right. were making them look bad. But the local law enforcement was very clear of, of appreciating the uh, uh, Oath Keepers help because they needed help. They they saw that we were we were there to, to keep uh, areas from being burned down and being damaged. And uh, but it was coming from from higher up from the feds to to the brass, and that's the problem is when you get federal funding going through the uh, going through your system, going through your uh, commission, you know, through your city uh, city uh, elements. That all of a sudden you you have to you have to obey somebody else instead of the people, and that's the sad thing. We as citizens have to do our best to be involved in government and see what our uh, local governments are doing and see what the cities are doing, the commissioners, who the commissioners are. Um, what do they, do they stand for, um, and your sheriffs, your local sheriffs, and, and make sure we're voting the right people in. Well, absolutely. You have a handle on it. We have seen the professionalism of Oath Keepers in now three different areas trying to de-escalate things and very successfully doing it in all three cases, also seeing that the government does not want things de-escalated. And also, as I pointed out earlier in the news, uh, Brandon, there's a uh, an effort by Senator Chuck Grassley to find out why 99.3% of the people who've had their firearms confiscated under these new procedures have been veterans who've been turned in by the VA for very, very minor things, not for being mentally disturbed, but for things that they uh, portray as being such uh, so that they can get their firearms uh, confiscated. It's very important that we have people who are veterans who have their loyalty to the Constitution, and quite clearly, you know, you're in a chain of command, you're trained to take commands, but Every soldier needs to, at one level, check these operations, these missions, the things they're told to do. They need to check that fundamentally against the Constitution because we're at a very, very dangerous point in our history right now. Oh, we absolutely are. And there's always advice to, to people who ask me, do they want to be you know, a young gentleman? He said he he's 15 years old, said he wanted to go in the Marine Corps. And, and I was like, well, I go, why the Marine Corps? Why do you want to go in? And I said also, why not the other branches? And why do you choose to serve? And then the next question was, do you know your constitution? I said, you come back with 
a definition of honor, loyal, loyalty, and integrity, and then you come back with me of understanding what the Constitution means, then I want you to, to go through the, all the other branches and, and determine, make an educated decision of, of where, to, where, you wanna, where you actually want to serve. I think that's something as, as law, even law enforcement officers themselves need to understand the Constitution. Yes. And we, a lot of my friends that are, that are law enforcement officers, they're trained that we, that are, that are, that are constitutionalists, Watch yes. out for us. Yes. Oh, Watch yes. Watch out for us. We, we, yes. are, um, we are trouble. Well, yes. that just shocks me that people who believe in the Constitution of the United States, is being, they're being trained, that we can't be controlled. And veterans that are skilled with their weapons and skilled with, yeah, we, we are, because we're not, we're not scared to, to go to battle. We, we're willing, we are very much so willing to go to battle in foreign lands. Yes. You know, to wherever our duties were. And a lot of these veterans, they, they, like I said, we um, are, are still serving our oath, never, never gives up. I know many law enforcement officers, former federal agents, they believe in the oath. They're very clear about it. They're very patriotic. And I want you know citizens out there to come together, learn the institution, go through that, learn that, and, and, and commun- uh, communicate with other groups and develop your own, your own neighborhoods at a small level. Um, we can't. The way we got to ch- make changes is, is first we got to make changes in ourselves, and then go through our neighborhoods, absolutely, and our local community. And you know that really is the true meaning of posse comitatus. Most people think of it simply as an act that prohibits the military uh, from being used as the posse for uh, the president. And yet, in the larger sense of it, in the traditional sense of it, posse comitatus was the power of the community. That is precisely yes, what Oath Keepers is doing. They are organizing in the power of the community. They are doing it professionally. They're doing it peacefully. That's the way you protect the community. When the community understands that nobody is going to hand them their freedom on a silver platter, then they will also take the Constitution seriously. They will also learn history. They will get involved and stand alongside of you guys. I I really appreciate what you're doing, and it's good that we see that uh, things have de-escalated there, and hopefully this is going to lead to them getting a fair hearing Uh, for their mind. It it certainly is a disgraceful situation to see going on throughout this country. Thank you so much for talking to us, Brandon Rapolo. Thank you, and I uh, I appreciate everything. And it's OathKeepersJoko.com. Please donate. Please go there and keep updated. Okay. Thank you very much. We've got the website up there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brandon. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Bye. Again, if everybody would take their freedom as seriously as Brandon, we would have a very different country right now. And I really do appreciate What he is doing, what the other Oath Keepers are doing, I think they're genuine heroes. And it reflects well, as he said, on the entire organization. Because we've seen this happen now in multiple areas of the country, mainly people at the local level. But again, it's that chain of command and that integrity comes from the top. Well, that's it for tonight's news. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel there. If you're not a Prison Planet TV subscriber, please subscribe to our our nightly news broadcast and support us financially. You can watch the news every weeknight as it happens, and you can share that with up to 20 friends, along with all of Alex Jones's documentaries. Well, join us again tomorrow at 7 Central. For all of recorded history, civilizations around the world praised the health benefits of silver. At InfoWars Life, our mission is to bring you the highest quality, purest, cleanest, effective colloidal silver on the market today for the lowest price available. When it comes to you and your family's health, InfoWarsLife.com is very excited to announce our biggest run yet of silver bullet colloidal silver exclusively available at InfoWarsLife.com. Now InfoWarsLife.com has taken colloidal silver to the next level using a cutting edge technique that is free of toxic artificial additives. Now more than ever, it's important to stock up on high quality silver bullet from InfoWarsLife.com and to help others during Christmas by teaching them about the powerful benefits of silver. Secure your silver bullet today at InfoWarsLife.com or by calling toll-free 888-253-3139. One of the most important and most often asked questions throughout human history is, where do we come from? What is the nature of reality? Where is our place in the universe? And to answer that question, you need to first ask yourself, do you care if humanity actually makes it into the future? 
Do you care about other individuals around you? Do you have a sense of racial consciousness for the entire planet and our species? Or are you the modern programmed man who has been taught to only care about themselves and who narcissistically believes that that, that, that actually gets you ahead in the world? So many people I talk to when they're brought face-to-face -face with globalist statements about humans being a disease and forcibly reducing population worldwide laugh at me and say, well, humans are a disease. We are scum. As if giving up on humanity and throwing in the towel and only saying that they want to eat, drink, and be merry gives them some type of power. It doesn't. So from my research and from my heart, from my common sense, the question of what is our ultimate destiny and where did we come from is answered by the decisions we make, the dreams we have, and what we manifest together through harmony. The collectivists sell a counterfeit of this. They say, why, you must give up the needs of the few or the one for the many, to quote Spock. We are told over and over again by the counterfeiters that are creating a synthetic form of what's natural that by giving up our individuality, we empower the collective. No, 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 no. It is by individuals coming together with their own diversity, their own perspectives, their own art, their own soul, their own passions, that we will create communities of harmony by individuals coming together through free will, through free association, by creating economies and cultures that truly reflect the dreams of the human heart and the human soul. That said, when you actually look into the literature of the technocratic ruling class, both intellectual and economic on this planet, there are two divergent groups. One group believes in humanity to a certain extent and is trying to warn us about the decisions that have already been made to dumb humanity down and ultimately call our numbers down to almost zero. The other group are the progenitors of the eugenics-based system of thought, and they are the dominant group in the elite who are controlling the development of our civilization towards a very dark end. So the dichotomy is between the two choices, a renaissance economy or an economy of conquest. The economy of conquest sells itself as altruistic and as the renaissance, but in truth, it is the plague. And what made me think about this today even deeper than I normally do, because these thoughts are constantly with me, was an article, several articles, but this one was out of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, with Stephen Hawking giving a hologram speech uh, to Sydney, humanity won't survive another thousand years unless it escapes Earth, physicist Stephen Hawking warns. So again, I ask you the question, do you believe humanity will make it? Do you even want humanity to make it? Or is it too scary to you so you just say you don't care? Because if you say you don't care, we will certainly end up destroying this planet. We will give up on everything our ancestors did, going through hell on earth to get us to this level. And we will desecrate and, quite frankly, piss on everything that greater men and women before us did. Are we really at this incredible historical point when we have massive knowledge and technology and innovation at our fingertips just going to be a bunch of nihilistic party animals that don't care and say F the world and watch our species fade into the night. Humans have made a lot of mistakes in the past, and it's normally during those crises that our greater angels show themselves. We have reached the point in our destructiveness, just as we have reached the point in our creativity, 
that if we continue down this road without a serious cultural discussion, we will undoubtedly destroy ourselves. The elites have run towards technology and oppression and brainwashing as a tool to dumb down the mass to make us more manageable so they can, quote, save the earth in this crisis. But in truth, they are some of the most evil, wicked, destructive people on the planet, and everything they do is to destroy and mutilate and vandalize the genetic code of the biospheres on this planet while creating red herring environmental problems that just give them total control over all life on the planet, like carbon taxes. Hawking is honest when he says we need to get off the planet, we're going to kill this one. The safest thing to do is to launch space colonies. The safest thing to do is colonize the moon and Mars. The safest thing to do is to create diversity of human ecosystems and terraform nearby planets. Plus, that is the classic human activity is exploration, is discovery. We are at an embryonic phase. I hope we don't abort our species before we actually get out of the womb. We should love our mother. We should take care of the earth, but we should realize that we must transcend the technocracy that is attempting to play God if we're going to make it to the next level. Stephen Hawking wanted to be safe when he said a thousand years. I'll guarantee you if he was probed deeper, he would agree it's more like 50. And it's not just people like Stephen Hawking. Apple co-founder on artificial intelligence said the future is very scary and very bad for people. And he goes on to talk about how AI is being designed from the beginning to not be designed for people. Now, that's what Wozniak is saying. And basically, they're warning you out of guilt because the decision has already been made to remove humans out of the equation. They already believe we're pathetic and a joke, and the elite have said openly, they plan to merge with machines and go to the next level. If they had even begun to go to the next level, they would understand they can never cull the mass of humanity and dumb us down to keep us in the dark, to control us, and that they would ever then ascend to the next level of human development and God's plan. It is total folly. Just look at the news today. 2,000 times normal radiation found in Tokyo playground, officials deny any link to Fukushima. That's in mainstream Japanese news and the South China Morning Post. 2,000 plus times a deadly dose, and they're saying it's no issue. Ukraine marked today, 29 years since the Chernobyl disaster. The UN estimates over a million people died from cancer from that one event, and it was much, much smaller in the amount of radiation it put out than Fukushima. That's from AFP. Why doesn't the elite care now? In the past, they cared when reactors melted down. They took precautionary actions. They had people not eat local produce for years after these events. Now they just say everything's fine because a sickness is, has entered our minds where we've written off humanity. We've decided it's all over. Humans, when they're barely surviving, struggle to survive, struggle to have the next generation make it. Prosperity makes monsters. Adversity makes men, to quote Victor Hugo. But it is in these times of decadence, like ancient Rome and its decline, that people get a death wish because they haven't actually experienced it. So many of these anti-humanists that say we should all die are the first to tell you they're scared to die whenever kill themselves. These are weak, powerless people who fantasize about control over others because to them it's an unknown country. I want to close with something I've covered many, many, many times, and that is a report from back in 1999 by Bill Joy. He wrote a story titled, Why the Future Doesn't Need Us. And in that report, he admitted that he met with over 200 world leaders in technology, and the debate was held on whether they should just give us toys and video games and fantasy lands to play in or whether we should just be exterminated. And most of the scientists said, well, we should just get rid of the general population because, after all, they don't really have a destiny. They're not people to begin with. 
And then this article is published and gets almost no attention. These are the huge, giant, mega massive, colossal, over the top epic issues that we deal with. And I'm just simply here trying to get the general public to understand if World War II killed over 100 million people, what will the next war be fought with? How many people will it kill? When you got the Hadron Collider and you've got all these record levels of tectonic activity and volcanoes and asteroids, what is, I ask you, the number one threat to humanity? And despite all of those threats, we've reached a point that if we made preparations now for asteroid defense and to study the tectonics and have predictive systems, and if we launched a program now uh, to build space-based platforms, uh, and to begin colonizing space, and if we began to be open with the public about the true mysteries of the world and to give people a love of life and information again, we could turn the tide. It's up to you, though. We will destroy ourselves very, very soon, and I'm just sad. I have all the different ancestral instincts and memories of my ancestors. I, I, I have children. I want to have grandchildren. I want their children and grandchildren uh, to be terra farmers on other planets. I want to build a world and a universe for humans and us working in conjunction with other species from our planet to empower not just ourselves but other life forms. That just seems like such a common sense goal. And instead, we're going in the opposite direction. They're not talking about space-based flight for man. They're talking about drones and computers. They're telling us we're old hat. Driverless cars, smart meters controlling our houses. But you notice it's not really machines that are going to run our lives. It's humans playing God through automated machines, through the smart grid, that are actually taking our humanity. The author wrote uh, in the script for They Live that uh, they live, the ruling class, we sleep. No, they live and we die. But in the process of killing our souls and our creativity, the elite themselves commit suicide as well. And they better remember that galactic rule of what comes around goes around. That's it for this special breakdown. Now it's up to you in the comments below to give me your take on this. More videos on this subject coming in the future because the questions of what is the ultimate threat to humanity is looking us in the mirror. We are the hope of humanity. We are the peril of humanity. And it's up to us to realize that. God bless you all. DNA force. When cells become toxic, they die early and aging sets in. DNA force. No one has put together a formula that focuses directly on brain health, nerve growth factors, and optimizing your cellular energy at the same time. Just one of the key compounds, BioPQQ, is backed by major clinical studies. DNA force. We now have the synergistic solution. Secure your DNA force today at InfoWarsLife.com or call toll free 888 253 3139. DNA force. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.